When I was awakened by my mother, I was real frightened. She says the white people are killing the colored people. She saw four men coming toward our house, and all of them had torches, lighted torches. After the gunfire, there was four or five white fellows that came to the house. And they set fire to the curtains. And there were airplanes that uh, seemed to have been dropping something down to the houses and setting them on fire. And that's when my little sister said, can is the world on fire? I said, I don't know. But uh, we had lots of trouble here. This white guy asked, where in the hell are you going? You using the N-word. Mm -hmm. And my grandpa said, we're going out of town. And he said, not this day, you're not going out of town. Bam! It's been 100 years since one of the worst acts of racial violence in American history. People from around the country descended on Tulsa for the anniversary, joining residents whose families have been here for generations, like Chief Egunwale Amusan, a descendant of race massacre survivors. We're at a march right now honoring the victims and their descendants. Just up ahead, there's a carriage with the remaining living survivors, and behind me, what you see is a masquerade where they honor the ancestors because the land that we're walking on is sacred. Just as there's tension around what justice looks like for the massacre, there's also a difference of opinion on how the Tulsa Race Massacre should be commemorated 100 years later. From May 31st to June 1st of 1921, a group of white men tore through Greenwood, Tulsa's wealthy African-American community, looting, killing, and then burning. They destroyed roughly 200 businesses and left nearly 10,000 black Tulsans homeless overnight. Close to 300 people were murdered. No one was arrested. We cannot deny that they have continued the systems of oppression. Yes. For decades, the city refused to acknowledge the crime or its role in it. But that became harder to do once local activists, combined with cultural phenomena like HBO's Watchmen, exposed the horrors of Tulsa's race massacre to a broader audience. In 2018, the city put together a commission to locate several suspected mass graves where victims might have been buried. Thank you all for being here tonight. The work of our uh, public oversight committee has been focused on phase one of our investigation. This very much looks to me like a, a human dug pit of some sort. Uh, the size of it is very indicative of what could be a common grave associated with the massacre. The initiative was supposed to be a move towards healing ahead of the centennial. Instead, the lack of immediate action revealed the deep and long-standing mistrust of the government by descendants of massacre victims. So I'm a little concerned about the lack of aggressiveness. The delay is a recognition of the difference in the nature of the property ownership. And if we have to pursue a, a, a court order, we will do that. Well, Mayor, but we would suggest if that we, we can do get that it, because if to, we can again, get it we with keep the, deference to the owner. And if it is a just trying to be crime, a good neighbor and well, work through but it. Months and months, Mayor. It does something to you when you have met one of the survivors. I am carrying their pain. And I am on a pursuit for justice. And I mean that with every being in me. I pray to God that none of this is a cover-up. I want to believe in my city, but I am so conflicted with what I'm hearing today. Mistrust of local authorities goes back to the fact that perpetrators of the massacre included city officials, law enforcement, and members of the Klan. As high-ranking leaders of Tulsa society, they were able to cover up the story. This World War II 45, I bought it from one of the widows. She was a witness. General Ed Wheeler wrote the first full historical account 50 years after the massacre. When I started to try to put together the project, I realized there wasn't anything in any textbook. There wasn't in any, any other book, for that matter. It's simply the Tulsa riot disappeared as far as written material went. 
This is 50 years after the riot. I went to the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office and I was told that their records were in deep records they could not get to. Tulsa Police Department had no records and they made it plain that their lunch hour was more important. Did you have any pushback from people in the community? I didn't have pushback as much as I had opposition outright. I had my job threatened twice. I had notes left on my windshield. It got uncomfortable enough that I transferred my wife and my five-year-old son to my mother-in-law's. The minute that story came out, all of that died off. And it took me a while to figure out why. They were afraid I was going to name names. By the time we get finished with this tour, you will understand, even people who think they understand the story still marginalize it and don't get it. Some of the victims' descendants have been trying to expose the extent of the massacre and its cover-up for decades. Only 40% of the original inhabitants rebuilt Greenwood. 60% never came back. Where are they buried? What river are they dumped in? What mass grave are they put in? And it was all homes and businesses. All the way that way, all the way that way. This is the Cotton Club. All of the bands who made the Cotton Club famous in New York City came to Tulsa first. That same sheriff who had Dick Roll in the courthouse building, that's him in the left corner next to that horse. Overnight, between midnight and 5 a.m., they devised a plan, deputized hundreds of white men. Don't let anybody call it a mob, because if you got a badge, you're sanctioned. That city sanctioned murder. So we have to tell our own story so that people know the truth about what really happened in Greenwood. This tour is gonna make me proud and angry at the same time. Absolutely, that's balance. <laughs> you give tours. Yes. In Greenwood. Why? Napoleon Bonaparte said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, history is a set of lies agreed upon. So I agree to tell my own story. I mean, like, where are we getting our information from? The same people who kept it a secret. What is your biggest fear surrounding the narrative of what happened? The last three living survivors will die without justice. That is literally my biggest fear. I've looked in their eyes just as I looked in my grandfather's eyes. And for them to look at you and tell you, Chief, don't let them forget us. <laughs> Excuse me. For them to say, don't let, them, don't, don't let people forget us. What I heard was, these people are trying to bury us while we live. I am 107 year old and have never been seen justice. I pray that one day I will. The three living survivors recently testified on Capitol Hill in front of a subcommittee on reparations. To this day, I can barely afford my everyday needs. All the while the city of this Tulsa have unjustly used the names and stories of victims like me. In 2001, an Oklahoma commission published the first government report on the massacre. Its main recommendation was reparations for descendants and survivors, but Tulsa failed to take action. Now survivors and descendants are suing the city to get them. In just a few decades, my ancestors would experience enslavement, false freedom, Jim Crow, and a Holocaust that would be hidden from the pages of history for 100 years. This is not a matter of past trauma. It is concurrent. I would like to welcome you into this sacred space. We are honored to have our survivors who you'll see in, the, in just a moment. Mother Fletcher and Uncle Red are in the building. Survivors have been fighting for restitution since 1921. They filed at least 193 claims to recoup damages after the massacre. None were paid out. Just days after the massacre, a local paper stated, another nigger town should never again exist in Tulsa. And policies like redlining and urban renewal prevented them from rebuilding. As a result, people in North Tulsa, the majority black part of the city, 
suffer higher rates of poverty and arrests. They also have a lower life expectancy than white Tulsans. Mayor G.T. Bynum's proposal for addressing his city's racial inequities is economic development. He set aside $42 million in tax incentives and loans to attract investment to Greenwood. But no black developers have been granted contracts. When it comes to direct payment reparations for the victims uh, and their descendants, what plans do you have in place to engage that? So I think when it comes to uh, payments, the challenge there is what's the source? Where does it come from? Where I run into challenges is if it's coming from a tax that's levied on everybody in Tulsa, when this generation of Tulsans did not carry out a crime. And I don't think that this generation of Tulsans should be financially penalized for something that criminals did 100 years ago. There's a lot of other things that we're trying to do on that front, and including economic revitalization and, and trying to rebuild Black Wall Street here. And what do, when you say rebuild it, what does that look like? We want to create an environment where uh, business and property ownership and wealth creation can occur. The development that are happening right now in Greenwood, are, are those black developers? Whether it's a college campus or the the baseball field or USA BMX's Olympic training and trials facility that's under construction? The answer is no. But the value of those projects is that they create a draw into an area and then that incentivizes the private sector redevelopment in the area. I don't know, wait a minute, come on, Mayor. Yeah. Stay with me on this one. Sure. Stay yeah. with me on yeah. this one. It was their land. It was their businesses. I don't think uh, a BMX training facility and a, a, foot, and a, a baseball stadium is gonna do the trick. No BMX arena or anything else that we can do today will make up for the tragedy that occurred in 1921. I mean, hundreds of our neighbors got murdered that night. There seems to be a lot of proposals around economic development. For who? I mean, for who? That's what you have to ask. And when you walk in deep Greenwood, you see all kind of stuff being built right. around Greenwood. Right. But all of the tax revenue is going outside what's in the center. What do you feel you deserve? You have to know what I lost to even ask that question. Casualties cannot be measured, right? Like you can rebuild a city, but you rebuild in the human spirit. I think we deserve the same thing the Japanese got. We deserve the same thing that Rosewood got. We deserve the same thing that victims of the Jewish Holocaust got because everything we lost fits, right? We are talking about mass graves, humiliation, being forced to wear tags as if you're property again. You're talking about a people who managed to do everything America has ever told you you need to do and then strip it from you like it's an experiment. Why is the city trying to throw a centennial and leverage it for money without paying justice to those people who deserve it? We've joined the march organized by the city to open up this pathway to hope that's sandwiched between a freeway and the baseball field. And compared to the march organized by the community and the descendants, I have to say this one lacks a, a certain, shall I say, color. And it's interesting that they call it the pathway to hope because if I was one of the descendants, I'd be like, I hope you're gonna give me some money instead of this, this pathway. The Centennial Commission spent over a million dollars to build this pathway. Part of $30 million raised to commemorate the massacre with most of the money allocated for a museum. Not one dollar went directly to the survivors or the descendants. Four mics and three drum mics. I say. Now we open the way. We call it the gatekeeper to open the way for us. I said, Kenny, Kenny, 
Justice for the descendants of the Tulsa Race Massacre begins with locating the victims and dignifying them with a proper burial. The excavation of suspected remains started this week. We're connected to this soil, this ground. Like our roots are here. We know our people are buried in these grounds. We're not disconnected from our ancestors. That's what we know Greenwood is us. Do you think America, by way of Tulsa's example, will ever be able to provide the justice that you are looking for when it comes to what has been done against black people? Hands down. Johnny Cochran told me himself when he was alive, if we win Tulsa, we can get justice in every city in the United States of America, including for reparations, for enslavement of African people. You have a living, organic case right here that could affect the whole nation. Why wouldn't Tulsa want to be the example, right? Like the, a real example of what it means to have hope, to have healing, to be able to transcend uh, incidents of the past through restorative justice. There are no options, right? Like, like when we look at the grounds here, what's the option for that? Acknowledgement? No, it wasn't. Clearly, it's not enough. That's, so that's why we're digging. Because we know what you see happening here is symbolic. Tulsa's got to dig deep into its own graves and recover the bones and figure out how can we fix what we did so wrong. Long live Greenwood. Reparations right now.